Hi, everybody. This is Marty Watts with American Talk It Up. I'm here with my co-host, Ed Nunes. Welcome to this after Super Bowl show. And Ed, I guess we've got some subjects we want to talk about today, the Super Bowl. We want to talk about Black History Month, and we're going to talk about our favorite African-American athletes. So let's get going on the Super Bowl uh, summary of the Super Bowl. What's your take on the Super Bowl last Sunday? I'll be honest with you, and I was wrong. I thought Tom Brady was done. I said that. I thought he was old and, you know, maybe uh, I hate to say washed up, but I thought I, did, I thought he was done. So I got to give him credit. You know, he won his uh, seventh Super Bowl, seventh Super Bowl, seven. So, but I got to say this too, though, to be fair to the Tampa Bay defense, they, they played great against New Orleans, against Green Bay, and against Kansas City. We didn't see Patrick Mahomes look as human as he did on Sunday. Uh, he was under pressure, pressured on 29 snaps in Super Bowl his you know it's in the in the Super Bowl and he didn't have any time to throw he uh, he had a turf toe injury but I don't want to take anything away from that Tampa Bay defense um the Dominican Sue Shaq Barrett Devontae David they forced turnovers they forced pressure Tyreek Hill had 263 yards receiving in the first game he was a non-factor and Tom Brady took advantage of the mistakes that Kansas City made and Rob Gronkowski did you think he'd come back and perform the way he did in the Super Bowl? So give, Tampa Bay hadn't won or even sniffed a Super Bowl since 2004. Tom Brady arrives in town, and they win a Super Bowl the first year that he's there. He's talking about playing until 45 years old, and who's to say that he can't? We've never seen this, Marty. In fact, uh, my brother looked up the oldest quarterbacks in the league. Benny Testaverde did play at 44. Warren Moon did play at 44. George Blanda played at 48. But did any of them win championships? They didn't. So uh, I'll shout out to Tampa Bay. I'll shout out to Tom Brady. They had a great performance on Sunday. Um, I didn't expect it. I really didn't. I'll be honest. Well, you know, and in this game, I thought going in that losing those two offensive tackles, I thought that Kansas City had two weeks to adjust to the offensive line. But obviously, it really hurt them because out of the 30 dropbacks by Patrick Mahone, he was pressured like 27, 28 times. He didn't seem like he was on. And I'll be honest with you, with them rushing four guys and playing deep cover two, the, the, the cover hill, it was tough. There wasn't – from very get-go, they were putting pressure on him. And then when the game was 14-6, to six, when the game was 14-6, to six, they call a timeout, you know, if they could have gone in the half 14, six, getting the ball back, that might've been something, but they call a timeout on third and two gave the ball, gave plenty of time. They got that pass interference and that last touchdown at the end of the first half. That was the, probably the game was over at halftime. You, you know what it was. And I still expected maybe KC is going to make a run. You know, we've seen it. We said this. Okay. Remember, Last year, they were behind against Tennessee 24 to nothing. All of a sudden, they scored 31 points unanswered. So I kept looking. Is there going to be any continuity, any kind of hope that they're going to come back? They couldn't run the ball. They couldn't throw the ball. They just, and you mentioned the two tackles being out was a huge issue. And give Tampa Bay defensive coordinator Todd Bowles a lot of credit. He should, he should probably be in line for a job somewhere, right? For a head coaching job somewhere because nobody had stopped Mahomes before. Now, there's some other factors, but I don't want to take any away from Tampa Bay. Their defense performed great. They shut down Mahomes. They shut down Tyreek Hill. Travis Kelsey, let's go back, Marty. In the first half, in the on, in the start, second quarter, Travis Kelsey drops a key pass on third and seven. He actually dropped two. So I'm not blaming him. I'm just saying the normal uh, the plays that they make, they didn't. Then there's no big chunk plays. They're used to make. They're used to making 40, 40 yards here, 20 yards here, 30 yards. And the Tampa Bay defense just limited to them. They put pressure on. They they uh, they tackled. They played a great game. And so, yes, Tom Brady deserved the MVP. But I'm saying that the Tampa Bay defense should not be overlooked. They had a great performance on Sunday. Well, you know, I was, you got to go back to 1957 and 58 when the Baltimore coach had a young quarterback came out of Louisville. And in 1957, they won the NFL title. And they're going in the 58 game against the Giants, New York Giants. And Johnny Unitas was in his prime. And that's how I compare Patrick Mahomes 
going, they won a Super Bowl, they're going back for a repeat. And it made me remind me of that 1958 game, Johnny Unitas in his prime, 25, 26 years old. And I thought I, I was going to give the edge to Kansas City. But obviously, when you don't have protection, when you're rushing the ball and you got to get Tampa's defense and then the old pro, maybe I shouldn't bet against him. I'm going to stop betting against Tom Brady. And, and you know what? He didn't throw a lot of long passes. There were, he was 10 for 30 with a lot of short passes, running attack, great mixture. The play action, I think what really helped him is that running back, uh, what's his name, Forte, or is that his name? Fournette. Fournette. They had play action. Play action was able to hold up the defense to get the short passes. And then Gonk, Gonk you, he had a great game. So I'll be honest with you. Um, Kansas City, after that, when the game was 14-6 to six and they couldn't stop it, that was the game was over when they got 21 points a half. Pretty much it was over. After that, it was it was downhill for Kansas City going in the second half. You know, another unit I want to give credit to is the Tampa Bay offensive line. All year long, they gave Brady time to pass. They protected him well. They had a few bad games early on. If you remember, earlier in the season, Brady was struggling. It was a new system. Remember, they didn't have OTAs either. They didn't have, uh, you know, camp. They didn't have exhibition games. And th th that goes for everybody. So Brady had to get these guys together at a park and, you know, throw passes to his receivers. But they, they made it happen. And I got to give the Tampa Bay offensive line. They got they did. They, they deserve credit. Now, let's be honest here. Let's be honest. I, I want to be honest with this. Tom Brady was not lights out against New Orleans. He was not lights out against Green Bay. He was not lights out against Kansas City. He didn't have to be. The defense played well enough to give him some short fields. I'm not saying that he didn't perform well. He did. But I'm still saying the Tampa Bay defense really put him in good position. They played very well. Very well. And I don't know that when, when we talked about it, Marty, you and I talked about it for a couple of weeks before. We talked about Antonio Brown. We talked about Chris Godwin. We talked about Mike Evans, Rob, Rob Gronkowski, uh, Jones, Fournette. We talked about the Tampa Bay offense. They had a lot of weapons. Antonio Brown uh, did catch a touchdown pass, I believe. Or, um, but anyway, it, you know, that's another story. But the defense is the one that brought them here. The defense has performed well. And I think they deserve a lot of credit. Now, Tom Brady's going to get credit. He's the MVP. He deserves it. But let's not forget, the Dominican Sue, how old is he now? He's, he's not what he used to be. But I'll tell you what, when if that guy gets a shot at you, man, he's trying to kill people still. And so the Tampa Bay defense, I think uh, they, they're very unsung, and they deserve a lot of credit for getting that victory in Super Bowl 55. Well, and here's the thing is, all the people that scored points for Tampa Bay was not on the roster last year. The place kicker wasn't on the roster. The running back, Gonk, none of those guys were on the – and Brown, all guys that Brady brought in. And there's no way these guys would have been playing for Tampa Bay if Tom Brady wasn't on that team. They wanted to play with it. They knew they had a shot. So all those guys who scored were guys who were not on the roster. That's the effect that – you could call it the Tom Brady effect on a football team. Yeah, you know, that's that's a it's a very good point. It's a very good point because before that, okay, last year, their quarterback is Jameis Winston, right? And Winston leads the league in interceptions. They've got talent, but in a, you know, he, he uh, so they they he goes to New Orleans and they they bring in Tom Brady. Now, Bruce Arians, he said this. He goes, "I didn't do anything. It's all the players and coaches." But think about his staff too. We're going to talk about he's got he's got a very diverse staff. Byron Leftwich, Todd Bowles, He's got two women on his staff. He's got the most diverse staff in the NFL. And they're going to get some jobs based on this because any Super Bowl winner, if you remember how many coaches from New England back in the day, and they didn't succeed very well at the head coach level, Romeo Cornell, Charlie Weiss, um, Matt Patricia, they all, Josh McDaniel, they all got head coaching jobs somewhere. Now, none of those four that I mentioned had great success coaching in the NFL. But they did get jobs. So you're going to see – I'd be very surprised if defensive coordinator Todd Bowles did not get a job. His, his, his defensive game plan was very, very good. And, again, Jason Pierre-Paul, remember a couple of years ago with the Giants, he, he blew off some of his hand with the firecracker accident. He played well. They all played well. So I've got, again, Tom Brady's going to get the credit. He deserves some. But I think that Tampa Bay defense – deserves more. I, I really do. I'm not saying Tom Brady's not great. 
people go crazy about that. He is. But the Tampa Bay defense definitely deserves some credit. So that first game, they played each other, what, in November, and they lost 20. Tampa Bay lost 27 to 24. But they gave up 17 points in the first half. And both started blitzing. He was blitzing. All of a sudden, he changed up his defense a little bit and pretty much shut down Kansas City in the second half in that first meeting. And I think it does help when you play a team for the second time. You learn how to set up your defense. And I think that really helped the defensive coordinator how to figure out Kansas City by playing them the second time. No, that's, that's a good point. And uh, Tyreek Hill, if you remember, he had 263 yards against Tampa Bay the first time. I mean, he was had, he had a field day. Who's been able to stop Tyreek Hill all day, all year long? No one. Who's been able to stop? He gets chunk yard plays, and he sure didn't on Sunday. He didn't get much at all. But again, remember, Marty, they always they said this before the game. Can Tampa Bay get to Mahomes with four rushers? And they blitzed a little bit. But again, those two tackles missing, uh, that really hurt them. And then they're lining up other guys that tackle. Bowles is shifting it up on the defensive line. He's disguising, disguising coverages which usually doesn't bother Mahomes, but you're talking about a quarterback that's used to stepping up, throwing with some comfort, looking at his first progression, his second progression. He wasn't even able to look at his first before he's under pressure. And then with that toe, now I'm not going to make excuses, but you could tell he was laboring. He couldn't run away from the rush like he normally could. So all things came together for Tampa Bay. Give him credit. Again, that defense performed very, very well. And I, I just, I, 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 I was wrong about Tom Brady. I really was. I thought he was done. I thought he was washed up, and he sure proved me wrong again. Well, I was wrong thinking that Kansas City could adjust to losing those two uh, uh, offensive tackles, and they really didn't. And he was under pressure. And then you could tell that Patrick Mahomes was not 100%. He was still mobile, but you could tell he wasn't at his best. So the best team won on Sunday – but I will tell you, talking about – now, let's just change the subject. What about next season? Who are going to be the teams are in the hunt? I, these are the teams I think are going to be on the hunt because they got a lot of guys back, and if they get some defensive players, they're going to get better. I got to believe Buffalo Bills, one of those teams that's on the rise. You got to believe Cleveland Browns. They get some defensive players. They're going to sign some free agents. The Browns got a, a lot – they got all five or seven of their draft picks. So I think the Browns are going to get better. Baker's on his way. Baker, Baker's in the perfect offense that fits him. And then you got to believe that uh, that those two teams. And of course, you got to believe that uh, that Baltimore is going to come back. I mean, I thought Baltimore was. I was more disappointed with Baltimore because I thought they might have beaten Kansas City. But they're another team with talent. So that American conference is really – it's going to be tough next year for Kansas City to repeat. Don't you think? It's going to be tough. These teams are on the rise. No, you know what? Uh, Baltimore, um, they've got – they've uh, you know, Lamar Jackson, as long as he's in the lineup, they're, they're going to have a chance. Um, now, there's a big trade in football with uh, Stafford, Matthew Stafford going to the Rams. The Rams have a good defense. How much does Stafford help them at 33 years old? He's a good quarterback. Does he make, does he make them better? I think he does. San Francisco had a lot of injuries this year, decimated by injuries. Do they come back? I, you know, I think they, you know, the teams you mentioned, uh, Cleveland is going to be good. You know, now Deshaun Watson, he's on the, is he going to get traded or not? Now, if he goes to Miami, does he make them? I'm just speculating. Does he make them an automatic contender? So there's going to be a lot of quarterback movement. They said Ben Roethlisberger is owed 48 million next year. Do they keep him? Does he leave? Does Dak Prescott come back to Dallas? But I think the teams that you mentioned, Baltimore is going to be in the hunt. Buffalo, for sure, is going to be in the hunt. Green Bay is Rogers is going to be back. They'll be they'll be back in the hunt for sure. Seattle, you know, they they need some uh, some better offensive linemen. Russell Wilson has kind of struggled behind that line, uh, so they'll they'll be in the hunt. So I think the teams you mentioned, Tampa Bay, um, they'll it would, it, as long as Tom Brady's there, and you know, he, he, you would think he only has a couple more years, but. I hate to say to write him off anymore because that guy said he's going to play past 45. And George Blanda, we mentioned, played till 48. But there's a difference between George well, Blanda. George Blanda was a great player. George Blanda was a great player. You know, you look at that Packer-Tampa Bay game, 
if they didn't give up that, if that it was just a bad defensive setup on the last play of the game in the first half. I, I got to believe the Packers could have won that game easily. They were, they were in at the very end. So getting back to the Super Bowl's top, get, can Kansas City get back there for three times? I say it's going to be difficult because these other teams are so close to beating them. You know what I mean? It's going to be tough. And I think Cleveland's there. I think the Brown, the Buffalo Bills, and you know Baltimore is. And here's another thing. Indianapolis really had a good team that they could get there. If Deshaun Watson goes to Indianapolis, they may, he makes them a great team. You know, and you they, they, uh, so, they mentioned yeah. that Indianapolis was looking to acquire. I can't remember which quarterback. It wasn't Watson, but uh, oh, um, Carson Wentz. Carson, Carson Wentz. Wentz. Yeah, Carson Wentz is uh, Indianapolis is looking to acquire Carson Wentz. So we'll see how because they've got the quarterback coach that used to coach Wentz is over there at Indianapolis. So if they get Carson Wentz, are they contenders? There's going to be a lot of quarterback shuffling you, in the offseason. Think about it. Seattle, Seattle's very close. And then think about the Arizona Cardinals. They improved their defense. They're just two or three players being really good with uh, with Kyle, with Kyle, you know, with Kyle playing for him, you know. So I, I Kyle Murray. So Kyle I. Murray. And then you know what? You're right about the 49ers. God, they were just devastated. They've got talent coming back. They're another team. I think it's going to – now, if those two teams show up in the Super Bowl, I'd be shocked because it's so hard to get back to the Super Bowl. There's so many good teams in the National Football League, so close. I and mean, think about it. I do believe if Baker Mayfield would have got that ball back late in the game, they might have – of course, I think Cleveland might have won that game against Kansas City. So it's so it's you just gotta have everything go your way to get to the Super Bowl. Am I right, Ed? You gotta have some breaks go your way. Yeah, I want you to think about this and and people that are watching think about this because you're right. You're right. Now I talked to Terrence Mathis a couple weeks ago and the Falcons went to the Super Bowl in 98. They were 14 and 2. The next year they're five and eleven. So I asked Terrence, I said, you know, T, what what happened? Well, we had our star wide receiver hold out. Our star running back blew his knee out. So it's the breaks of the game, right? Now, how in the heck has Tom Brady made 10 Super Bowls? 10. Now, he was with a great coach. To me, Bill Belichick is the greatest football coach we've ever seen. Look how many players he's lost over the years, and they still won. At one point, they won 20 games in a row, 20 NFL games in a row, and people don't understand how hard it is to win in the NFL. 20 straight games. So I think he did benefit from being with Bill Belichick, but give him his credit. He left New England. And, you know, that's a, another sidebar story there, Marty. Who is more important, Belichick or Brady? And how does Belichick feel? I feel I, I think he's probably proud. He's the one that groomed Tom Brady, right? There might be a little bit of uh, ants there that he didn't get. You know, he, he didn't he didn't get to the Super Bowl and Brady won one. But he's got to feel proud of him, I would think. Yeah, and I agree with you. So it's good. But I, I think next season. There's so many teams that are very close to getting to the Super Bowl. It's going to be tough for any of these teams to repeat. But it, but we'll see. And, you know, a few injuries here, an injury there, things changed. And that's kind of how the game goes. But, but I, to wrap this thing up and go into the next segment, I will say that I, I give all credit to Tom Brady. What a great effort for a man 43 years old. Does he have a couple more years in him? I guess if he gets protected and the offensive line stays intact, I think in the way he play, the way he can play the game, I got to believe he can play at a top level for another couple of years, in my opinion, from what I saw last <laughs> Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to say no, right? But look what he did. Look what he did. You know, who's the – now, look, remember this, though. Now, now I had a kind of a different take. Um, now, he's, he's the greatest – you know, he won seven, right? But when we talk about great athletes and great guys at the skill, the skill position, uh, the skill set. Now, am I going to say he's better than Elway or Rogers skill set wise? Now, some people I told that to went nuts. He won more championships. Yes. But remember, he's a seventh round draft pick. Right. And if you remember the pictures at the combine, he doesn't run the fastest. He doesn't throw the farthest. Right. Now, he's he's not that big guy with the big uh, cannon arm. All he does is win Super Bowls. That's all. So. Yeah, he, he, you know, thinking about it, he's going to be 44 next year, right? He'll be 44 years old, 44. And most quarterbacks of recent memory that played at that age, Peyton Manning started breaking down at 40, 37. 
Philip Rivers played, and he's going to retire. But 44, uh, that's just incredible. And he's, you know, who's going to bet against him next year? Who's going to bet against him that he won't win another one? So it's just incredible. It really is. Well, like I said, it's going to be tough to get back to the Super Bowl. Hey, listen, let's talk about our sponsors, Everguard Roofing and Solar. And we want to, I want to shout out to them. By the way, folks, if you have any kind of roofing or if you're looking for a solar system where you can get it to pay for itself and be and get off the grid, you want to go to Evergar Roofing and Solar. And then we want to thank our patrons on Route 66, all these businesses, these restaurants, do the takeout. And I want I, I want everybody out there who has a favorite restaurant really support the takeout. These guys are struggling. And you know what I'm talking about, Ed. You've talked to the Restaurant Association. They're having a tough time. I'm hoping that the restaurant's going to open up to 50% real soon. What do you think? You know what? I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. And I'm, you know, I, the reason I hesitated is because there's so many things we're thinking about. School, restaurants, so many things that have been hurt by this pandemic. Um, so, yes, uh, I did have Carol Ryan on. You mentioned that. Uh, and that was a heck of an interview we had with her. And I just think of every time I think about that, and my wife and I do uh, patronize local. We do get a lot of carryout from local. So yes, yeah, support local, man. Um, they need it. They, they're hurting a little bit right now. And it's gonna, you know what? It's gonna take a while for us to get back to what we were, but I think there's hope now. There's another vaccine out there, Johnson vaccine. That's a, a one dose vaccine. And I know our producer, Jimmy Tran's gonna say, you know, take your uh, vitamin your vitamins and, you know, make sure you're eating right and take care of yourself other ways too, because, um, you know, Marty, we've both known people that have come down with this and some people have, uh, it, they've gotten better real quick and some other people we know it did, they didn't. And that those are just the facts and people are, you know, are going to, and, and there's, there's been some people that I know that caught it that had no underlying condition. So that doesn't always be the truth either. I the, the, the only thing I do know is this virus is totally unpredictable and we don't know who it's going to affect. So yeah, take care of yourself, wash your hands, social distance, and hopefully by next year, you and I are having a different conversation, or even Marty, and a couple of, you know, hopefully by June, July, we're having a much different conversation. Well, you know what? One of the greatest days I look forward to, Ed, and I know you're going to chuckle this, when I can see you doing a play-by-play in a press box, and I'm watching you on ProView Networks on Channel 26 or streaming, and I can get to watch the great Ed Nunes does his thing in the in the press box doing a play-by-play call. Now that would be I would be a happy camper, and we'll go celebrate when that day comes back, right, Ed? Well, I got to tell you, Marty, that you know I, I'm fortunate. You know, when I was a basketball official for 22 years, I had a seamless transition to broadcasting, and I never take it for granted how privileged I am to be able to do this for the kids you know, the coaches, the parents of the state of New Mexico. And I'll tell you one thing, you're going to laugh about this. I remember a couple of years ago at the state tournament, I did 20 games. I was kind of tired, man. But my, my son, who's, you know, a great color guy, one of the best color analysts there is, no doubt about it. Him and I would go down to the floor and I would talk to the coaches, the players, and the officials, because I know the officials too. And when I was done talking to them, my adrenaline would go like I was ready to play again. And it gave me an energy, gave me a boost. And so I think any play-by-play person that we have, and we've got some of the best, you know, Richard Tripp, Sebastian Noel, Leroy Lucero, Adam Deal's a great play-by-play guy. There's Scott Galetti, Robert Portnoy, there's, some, there's Henry Tafoya. There's great people that I've learned from. Everyone's got their own style. But for me, it's a privilege to call these games. I never look at it anything other than that. It's a privilege to call these games and, and, and for the parents, the kids, the coaches of New Mexico, right? Let's uh, hopefully we're getting closer to that moment, Marty, and you're right. When we do get there, man, I, it's good. I can't wait to celebrate, man. I can't wait to see so, uh, that. Yeah, I can't wait. So folks who are watching this uh, uh, podcast, American Talk It Up, if you're in Albuquerque, we're going to have a celebration at the Lava Rock Brewery uh, restaurant. They're out there on uh, Uncher Road. When, all this, when we get back to regular broadcasting, we're going to have a little celebration and we'll invite people to come and and you can get a chance to talk to me or Ed, any of our broadcast people. Of course, Ed will tell you some great stories about his life as a referee and all the years he's been broadcasting. And if you don't know this, 
uh, Ed's still the voice of Western New Mexico Mustangs. He'll be, hopefully we'll get you back doing the college games here soon. You know, it's uh, athletic director, Scott Noble out there at Western. I love that guy. That guy's a good guy and he's going to get Western. It's going to take a little while. And this is, uh, this is kind of a step back where his goals want to be. I know that, but he's going to get them there. That's a one good guy. And I'll tell you, every time that we went out there last year, you know, and the roads are hard. I'm not, let me just explain something to people. Now you've been down to Western. You got to go through the Gila, right? And it's, it's a great trip. Tom Dragmeister, the, uh, uh, his, his, his brother Dick, was the great head coach at Western. Tom went down with us a couple of times and was, you know, pointing out things on the way down there. But I'll tell you one thing that people don't know is the road can beat you up, man. The road beats you up a little bit because after the game we come back, you know, and, and uh, we're, we're coming back late at night. Sometimes I'm like, I got one eye open on those one line, uh, one lane highways coming, coming, uh, you know, going to Dammy, going through Dammy. But I'm, I'd be a liar to tell you that I didn't have the time of my life being the voice of a university. It's an honor and a privilege, man. And at the end of the year, I got to tell you this: there were some parents that came to, to go to watch their kids in the final basketball game, and they came to us and they said, "Hey, we, we you're, you guys are in our living rooms every night. Thank you for what you do for the." Because I always want to make sure from New York, you know, uh, Trey Trey Sanders, Rodney Hill from Philadelphia, you know, want to make sure because these people can't make it to Silver City. So who's ever listening out there, we want to make sure we give the kids a shout out, right? This is where they're from. They're averaging 14.6. Elijah Holyfield, he played for uh, Western last year. His dad came up to me and was so nice, just such a nice man, and said, you, you know what? You guys did a great job out here. And it's for the, for the, for the kids, right, for the, for the students. And, and, you know, and hopefully we painted a picture of what's going on there at Western. My, my responsibility is a big one. I take it very seriously. I've got a lot of passion for it, and we want to make sure that we're making Western New Mexico shine as much as we can. So uh, people are watching this podcast, American Talk It Up. Just when we get, when, hopefully we'll let you know when Ed's going to be on the air. I mean, we'll be doing this show, and, and, and we'll let people know how, how you can watch Ed, what, what streaming device you could go to, what channel, because Ed's going to be, uh, and if you've not seen Ed do play-by-play, -play, he's pretty exciting. It's almost, you remind me of, of Ray, of Roy's story of the Los Angeles Kings. The signature line was shot on goal. Well, you know, when they score for the Western New Mexico Mustangs, boy, you've got a signature call, right? <laughs> you know what? We, we've all got our, our signature calls. And, uh, you know, one thing I had to learn, though, I got to tell you this, is that my voice is kind of strong, so I had to learn not to, to, to control it to control my voice. And those are lessons you kind of have to learn on your own. Um, Scott Galetti would tell me a couple of things about my voice and he made me really ingrained into, into my mind about that. And so I learned how to control, be excited, but don't go to the red zone on the mic. I had to work and work on it. I'm still working on it. Um, you know what? I think one of the things, Marty, is you're a former athlete. You played football and you played rugby. That competitiveness as an athlete never leaves you, ever, never leaves. If you compete on the field, you compete at your job. You compete as a referee. You compete as a broadcaster. You know, you want to be the best there is, and that doesn't mean you always are, but you sure try. That's for sure. I remember talking, probably one of the greatest broadcasters. He was the voice of the Southwest Conference. He did the Liberty Bowl. He did the Cotton Bowl. He did maybe one of the greatest games ever played uh, between Notre Dame and Texas. And he did the Texas-Arkansas game, national championship game in 68. Connie Alexander. Now, my mother was a drama teacher from the University of Oklahoma, and Connie used to talk to me about voice variation. That's what you're talking about. When they raise a voice on a key word, key play, you can't be high all the time. And now in acting, the actors on the stage have to learn how to control their voice. They call it voice variation. I don't know what they call it in broadcasting, but it is, to be a great broadcaster, you've got to learn to use your voice at the right time when to raise your voice, when to go down. And that's the key of, of any broadcasting. And I've learned that from talking to the great broadcasters of all time. One of them is Connie Alexander. And of course, he's, he passed away about what, four or five years ago, but well, he was a legend in his day. You know what, um, such great memories of him and Bill Stranigan calling the uh, TVS game of the week. I remember that like it's yesterday. And then Connie did some high school basketball along with coach Bob King, the former Lobo coach. Uh, the former great Bob King and Connie 
would hear me do PA at the uh, UNM baseball field. And he would always tell me, hey, that sound great, Ed. You sound good. And a compliment from Connie always meant something because that guy's a Hall of Famer, man. He did stuff in this town broadcasting-wise that none of us will ever do. Some, some Now, Scott Galletti had done uh, some big-time college games, um, but Connie Alexander – uh, wow, uh, that's a you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a that's a name of, of that uh, it, you know, it's just a lot of respect. So, 1964, December 1964, Connie Alexander is at the Liberty Bowl in Memphis, Tennessee, and guess who's his call his call host or broadcast uh, guy was Harry Carey, the voice of Chicago Cubs. Say at that time. He was the voice of St. Louis Cardinals. But during the winter, he did University of Missouri football games. And so he, him and Connie teamed up in the 1964 Liberty Bowl. Okay. So they're, they're just before they're about to get on the air, uh, uh, they, the phone up in, the, in the, you know, the press box, they get a phone call and the guy asked for Harry Carey. And so Harry picks up the phone and it was Elvis Presley on the phone. And Elvis said, you know what, Harry, would you, why don't you and Connie, I'll pick you up in a limousine after the game, come over to my house and we can have ribs and beer and let's just talk sports. And he said, are you sure you're hell, Elvis? He says, believe me, I am Elvis. When you uh, show, when you come down from the press box, I'll have my limousine there to pick you guys up. Sure enough, after the game, a limo, a limo picks him up and they take him to Graceland. And that night, Connie and Harry Carey spent all night with Elvis drinking beer and ribs and talking sports and music. Uh, what a story that is. What do you think? <laughs> wow. You know, that, uh, that is just, I'm trying to imagine that in my mind. Um, Harry Carey, again, the great uh, Chicago Cubs announcer, St. Louis Cardinals announcer as well. And I remember listening to him in the eighties a lot with Steve Stone. And of course his signature home run call. It could be, it is. Oh man. <laughs> Uh, Holy cow. They, Holy yeah, cow. And, and then they said that during the games that uh, Harry Carey liked to have a few pops too, man. You know, so I, I don't know if that's true or not, but he was entertaining. And Connie, I, you know, I, I worked with Connie a little bit when I was the director at Cesar Chavez Community Center. He had properties in the area. So I got to know Connie a little bit. And like I said, I, and you were about to have him come and talk to us as announcers when he passed away. I remember that because you had said that. And uh, it's too bad we didn't get to. I'll tell you. you know, yeah. I'll tell you one of my greatest Harry Carey stories. This is 95, the summer of 95. He was still broadcasting for the Cubs. He was getting up there. He, he would make blunders, but nobody really cared because it was Harry. Well, anyway, he had a restaurant called Harry Carey's down there by Rush Street. It's about, it was about three blocks away from the best uh, steakhouse, in, in my opinion, Gibson Steakhouse. And, it, and to be able to get a reservation on a Saturday night at Gibson, it, you had to, six months, you had to get your name on the list. And so my girlfriend at the time and I, we, grew, we drive down to Gibson, we had a seven o'clock, uh, uh, you know, reservations at the famous steakhouse, Gibson. So we go and get our car valet. And just when we got out of our car, this black limousine, this a black BMW, drives up and he has a flat tire right in front of Gibson's. And I go, and all of a sudden, about two minutes later, a limousine drives down and Harry Carey pops out. Now remember, Harry was close to 80 years old. Harry runs over and starts changing the tire. And it, it just, <laughs> and, it, and the fans, everybody's going crazy and nuts. There's the police is out there, the streets going nuts, Harry. And there's Harry changing a tire right in front of this place. And the people were going crazy. And then finally he puts the tire on and he looks up and he thought he was gonna die. He says, the beer's on me and Harry carries. And I said to my girlfriend, we're going to Harry's. And we walk three blocks down there. Harry shows up and starts singing Frank Tinatra, Dean Martin songs, and the place went nuts. That's how he got him over there, okay? And they were competition, Gibson and Harry Carey. Well, I thought, I thought that was just really weird, you know, Harry Carey. Well, anyway, after Harry Carey died about five years later, I went back to Harry Carey and I saw his wife. And I, you know, is, is that his wife, his, his widow. And I went up to him and told him that story. Yeah, she, she said, you know, Marty, we did that every other month, just to get more business. It was a setup. 
<laughs> uh, I'm not surprised. You know, it worked, though, right? It worked. It worked. And, and, and you know, right now, Harry Curry's own – one of the owners is Bob Costas and some of, I think some other famous people in Chicago, but Bob Costa owns the, the building and the restaurant, Harry Carey's. But yeah, it was a setup. And I, I thought it was, I thought the guy really had a flat tire. He probably did, but it was just to get people to come to his place there on Rush Street. And I mean, the street went nuts, the cops, and there's Harry. And Harry died about two years later. You know, you heard, you know, he died at spring training, but that's a, isn't that a great Harry Carey story? Yeah, you know what? The guy uh, lived life to the fullest, no question about it. And, uh, yeah, he was an entertainer, and you know, who can forget Take Me Out to the Ball Game, right? Nobody could sing it like Harry Carey from the booth, sing it every game, every seventh inning. It's Harry Carey, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. And, man, the fans at Wrigley ate it up. They loved him. And, you know, we're talking about Connie. Connie did a bunch of games with Jack Buck, Harry Carey, what's what's the guy that was the voice of the of the of the um, the Angels, and then he was the voice of the Padres, Dick Emberg. Yeah, Dick Emberg. He did a bunch of basketball games, and then of course Dick Emberg started out as the voice of UCLA Bruins when John Wooden was the coach. You know, uh, Dick Emberg, man, he was one of the uh, one of the best. I went back to a broadcast when UCLA lost to Notre Dame and broke their their winning streak, and at the end. What a call. It's all over. You know, just the way he said it. Um, oh, my. His signature uh, his signature phrase. Oh, my. Oh, my. Dick Enberg was one of the best. Love Dick Enberg. And, you know, and Connie started out as the voice of the, Albu of the, of the Albuquerque Dukes back in the early 50s. Then he was the voice of the, of the Lobos. And then he got that big break to become the voice of Southwest Conference Game of the Week. And he would leave every Friday to go somewhere, to, someplace. And back then, the Southwest Conference was a big time football conference. Now it's broken up. The Big 12 and the Southeast Conference broke up the Southwest Conference and teams. But anyway, we were very fortunate. Of course, we, of course, we had the greatest Lobo, your favorite Lobo play by play guy for a long time. Uh, Mike Roberts. Mike Roberts. And, 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 and of course, there's Mike. And, and so I, I think I'll be honest with you. Uh, there was, when I lived on the West coast, when I lived in San Diego, I would be at La Jolla beach or, or, you know, Pacific beach. I'd be sitting out there right on the beach at a nice little restaurant patio. And this is about seven o'clock at night. I had my little transistor and I would turn it on and there is the Lobos bright and cl very clear you could if they, it was 50,000 watts and I would listen to the Lobo football game or basketball game on the you know on, at the ocean having a beer or just beautiful sunsets listen to Lobo sports with Mike Roberts nothing better than that sitting out there uh, on a California beach listen to the Lobos what do they call it? 50,000 watts of power for KKOB? Yeah. So you can probably it picked get up very clearly there in Los Angeles and there in San Diego. And so I, I was able to listen to those games. And that's why the Lobos always try to recruit kids in California because their families can listen to games at night. Yeah, times have uh, changed now. Everybody can stream. But back in the day, that did mean something. And, you know, I got to say about Mike, uh, Mike Roberts, the late great Mike Roberts, um, was the biggest Lobo homer there ever was, right? Now, I say that affectionately because I'll tell you, don't make a call against his Lobos. He'll tell you about it. I still remember when Bobby, oh, Bobby Dobber is going to make a, another call. Amazing. That was, you know, and remember where Mike Roberts uh, had his perch at the pit. Now everybody's on press row. Back in the day, Mike had his own seat, man. He wasn't on press row with everybody else. He was by himself over there, uh, oh, you know, over there right behind the Lobo bench. So um, I listened to many, many games of Mike Robertson. I got to tell you, you're going to laugh about this. I told you I had a remote out to him one time when I was uh, hosting the locker room for ESPN. And it was intimidating because I, I, I had heard Mike all my life and I didn't want to make any mistakes. And, you know, having the great Mike Roberts on the other line and you're just kind of breaking into the broadcast business, it was a little bit intimidating. But, I, you know, I learned and I got through it. And Mike was a gentleman about the whole thing. I think the greatest compliment I ever got uh, gotten from somebody about Mike Roberts was I'm in California back in the, in the middle eighties and I'm at this, this, this 
one of the greatest sports bars in Belmont Shore over by Long Beach. There's a place called Belmont Shore. That is a place called Panama Joe's. And it was, it was a big hangout with sports stars and, and celebrities. And one night I'm in there and guess who's in there sitting there with, a, with, with another guy, Chick Hearn. Remember the voice of the Lakers, Chick Hearn? Oh, yeah. And he was like the most – him and, and Vince Skelly were, were the two greatest broadcasters probably in California. It was Chick Hearn for the Lakers and, of course, Vince Skelly for, you know, for the Dodgers. So I went up and introduced myself to Chick Hearn, and I told him who was my favorite. And he, and he, I thought he was one of my favorite broadcasters. And he said, where are you from? And I said, Albuquerque. I'm a Lobo fan. And then he brought up Mike Roberts. He said, boy, you guys got a great broadcaster, Mike Roberts. He's sure big time. And, and I told that story to Mike about a year before he died, and he really got a chuckle out of it that Chick Hearn recognized him. You know, it's funny when you mentioned uh, Chick Hearn and uh, Vince Scully being, you know, two of the best in California, you could make an argument that two of the best in America. Vince Scully, as far as baseball, might have been the best I ever heard. Now, Bob Costas is very good. You know, there, of course, there's the uh, the old time um, Marty Gleckman, uh, Marty, uh, uh, Marty Brenneman from Cincinnati. There's so many of them. But as far as baseball and the way that Vince Scully described the game, man, and then the stories he told. And you never heard him make a mistake. It's like Dick Clark with American Bandstand. Dick Clark was flawless. When I used to hear Dick Clark on the $25,000 pyramid, and Vince Scully in baseball, tell me who's better at baseball than Vince Scully was. I don't, I don't think there was anybody better than him. So back in 1988, the Dodgers were still doing their spring training in Florida, Vera Beach, before they moved to Arizona. And I went down there for spring training and I went down there, and of course, they were still part of the Albuquerque Dukes, you know, the, the Dukes. And I went down there, and I was, and I, and I saw Ben Skelly, and I sat there, and I followed him most of the day. I just kind of followed where he was going. Now, I, I finally realized how much prep this guy did. He interviewed minor league players, every major... He knew what Cub Scout group they were in, their grandmother's favorite recipe. Remember you would watch a Dodger game, and he said, there's old Charlie Thomas. His mother makes a good roast beef. Remember, you know, that kind of stuff. Hey, right. that, kid was, that kid was in Boy Scouts, and he got a medal in, in swimming or something like that. Well, you, know, you wonder why how he got all that information. Well, during spring training, he would go around and get tidbits on every player. He talked about he had a he must have had a file on every guy they ever, and then he did it for the opposition. I was amazed how much and you know in a baseball game you got to fill in time, right, Ed? You've done baseball games, and <laughs> and so you know, yeah. can you imagine? He knew everybody. He knew his mother's best recipe. Oh, did you know his dad was a plumber there in Glendale? And boy, he was a good plumber, you know, stuff that you would never know. That's what made those broadcasts interesting. He had stories on everybody. Well, you know, I told you when I was doing Lobo PA, I'm right next to Robert Portnoy. Now, you, you know, and, and Robert prepares now. I'm not putting him on the level of Vince Scully. Robert's a very good, very good announcer. But he would have the same kind of stories. I talked to Jack Bracante, you know, in the batting cage. And Jack was telling me that he switched his grip on the bat. And something like that, I, I just would look at him like, wow. I mean, because he's got a lot of time to fill, right? He's got a lot of time to fill. Now, we said this on an earlier broadcast, but I still got to mention it. In front of Robert Portnoy, he's got the monitor right here. He's, he's charting every pitch, every pitch he charts. And then he's got all his uh, stats taped down. So it doesn't because the wind over there at that Santa Ana Starfield might kick up and blow all over the place. So you talk about prep. You talk about being prepared. Uh, wow, Robert Portnoy is impressive. Scott Galetti does a lot of prep. Scott Galetti preps for like a week or two before the game even starts. So I think I learned a little bit by listening to them. And when I did my Western broadcast, make sure I reach out to the uh, SID at Western and at the other school. What information do you have on your team? And then by the broadcast, I you know cut it all down and was ready. Not not to that level. Those guys, um, Robert and Scott. Their, prep, their preparation is amazing. It really is. Well, you know, the problem we have at ProView Networks is we're doing five or six games a week, and we're asking our guys to broadcast three of those games. It's difficult to do that. 
intense prep, as you know, Ed, because you just don't have enough time to dig on every team. Usually by the middle of the season, you've seen these teams enough, you know a lot about them. And that's what happens when we get better. But early in the season, it's tough because you just don't have all the time to prep on everybody because you're doing so many games a week. Well, some of the other things, too, is not every team has stats. Some teams don't want to put those statistics out on max preps. A lot of coaches don't want to do that. And so, they, you know, they're very – some some coaches – lot of, most coaches do. They share the information. But some coaches don't want people to know what their team is doing. So you have to kind of rely on seeing them. Did you see them? And, uh, you know, Jim Murphy is a perfect example. He doesn't do stats. And that's okay. Jim Murphy's won, what, 16 championships? Um, so, um, yeah. yeah. So a lot of coaches just don't put that information out there. But at the college level with Western, I can, you know, I'm lucky I can get uh, information from the SID at Western and then the schools that they're going to play. So I was able to get a lot of information, which is key to any broadcast. You know, you got to do is ask yeah. Robert Portnoy or Scott Galetti. You know, they, they're, they're the kings of getting and uh, of, of, of getting information out there. Well, you know, we're, we've been very fortunate. We've met some great broadcasters. I never had your skill level. I've been, I've been since working at ProView, I get a chance to watch all the broadcasters and get a chance to see who are who, their style. And so I've been very fortunate, unlike any anybody else, I get a chance to see them all perform. And, and I've gotten to the point where I really appreciate the guys like you to do play by play, how hard it is. And it's, it's difficult. And that's why you won't ever see me in a, in a broadcast booth. I mean, I've been asked to be a commentator, but even a commentator, you've had Gary Sanchez. And of course, you've had some guys who really did their homework as a as an analyst for you, right? You had guys who, and I think it's not that easy to go up there because you've got to understand the offense, defense. And you've been very fortunate. You've had some really good uh, analysts on your broadcast. Well, I've had, uh, you know, Roger Holian that used to be a football coach for many years. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he was a Lobo football chaplain with Rocky Long. So he knows football quite a bit. When I got Gary Sanchez, uh, Gary's a former coach at Highland. He's been around the game for a long time. And Gary, yeah, he, you know, he knows all the routes. He knows all the blocks. So Gary's very, very good. Um, I used to use Coach Otman, your coach at Sandia. And Coach Otman has that big, boomy bone. Boom, you know, that big booming voice. And then, it, like John Madden, I love Coach Ottman. I, Coach, uh, Coach Ottman's a great analyst, and he's going to tell you like it is. You know, he doesn't sugarcoat anything, but he doesn't cuss yeah. or anything like that either. He just tells you what you just saw. And, I, you know, I, I really I really like him. I got to get him back. He's just a good guy. I have a lot of respect for him. So, yes, I've been very lucky. And in, in, in basketball, like I told you, I've used Damian Segura. He's excellent. My son, he's good. So I've had a very good color analyst as far as uh, being in the booth. I've been very fortunate. So listen, we got a, we've got a break for a commercial. Uh, I want to thank Evergard Roofing and Solar Company. And you know, folks, you could go, you could have Evergard Solar call you up and they will tell you what you have to do to go off grid and how you could turn solar into a positive thing on your electrical bill. And of course, roofing, they're the best. And so we want to thank Dave Simmons and the staff at Evergard Roofing Solar, sponsor American Talk It Up. I want to thank uh, ProView Networks for putting this on the air on Comcast 26 on Thursday nights at 8 o'clock. You can watch us on Comcast. You can watch us on, on Facebook or YouTube. And if you come to Facebook, sure hit the like button. On, on YouTube, hit the description button. But with that saying, Ed, we have now been, I think we're over 30 broadcasts now, 30 episodes. That's a lot, isn't it? No, you know, it really is. It's a, it's a lot of fun. I, I look forward to the show, and um, we talk about a lot of different things, and we're going to start talking about more American stuff, and I think that that's fitting. Of, you know, it's an America talk it up, and I think it's fitting that we celebrate America sometimes. Uh, people are, are so into the divisiveness about red and blue, and you know what? Sometimes just talk about how great America is and why we love it. I think sometimes that, that, that's good. And talking about that, this is going to be a new segment about America. What makes America great? What's your favorite food, restaurant, favorite America, favorite sports fan, whatever. We're going to talk. This is going to be part of our show now. What, we're going to bring people together. What makes us great Americans? 
because we are a country of diversity, diversified people. And, and what makes us is, is, is when we come together as a nation. And so the day we're going to talk about Black history, this is Black History Month, right, Ed? The month it of is. February. And then Ed and I decided, who's our favorite African-American athlete? And, and I've got a couple, but why don't we start with yours, Ed? Who do you feel is your favorite? You know what? I'm going to go in several. You know, there's so many, right? But I'm going to go in categories. So in boxing, it was Muhammad Ali. In baseball, it was Reggie Jackson. Now, football, I've got so many because I'm a Cowboy fan. I'm a big Cowboy fan. But I can't say one. But, you know, I, I like Tony Dorsett, Emmett Smith, Michael Irvin. So I'll, I'll go there. And um, in um, basketball, it's Magic Johnson. So – those are my favorite uh, African American athletes: tennis, um, Venus Williams, um, or uh, um, I'm sorry, Serena Williams. Um, so track and field, there's so many of them to name right there. I don't think I can name one track and field athlete. I watch it, but uh, there's so many. Those are my favorites, though: Muhammad Ali in boxing, Magic Johnson in uh, in in basketball, in football. You know, I, I mentioned Dorsett, Emmett Smith, and uh, and uh, Tony uh, Tony Dorsett. And in baseball, I didn't think I'd mention baseball. Baseball, God, there's so many. Uh, Hank Aaron, Willie Mays. But my favorite was Reggie Jackson. Reggie Jackson was my favorite because that guy, every time he came to bat, even when he struck out, man, exciting, exciting. I, I saw those three home runs he hit against the Dodgers in 77 on three straight pitches. Uh, Reggie Jackson was one exciting, uh, 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 controversial, arrogant, had a big mouth. Came through when it needed, though. He's got himself five World Series rings. So that was my; those are my favorites. All right, so let me go with mine. Let's start with boxing. Uh, obviously, Muhammad Ali, but my my favorite as a kid growing up was Sugar Ray Robinson. And he was, if you didn't see him box, he was one of the greatest. One of the greatest. And then in baseball, I got to go with Ernie Banks. I got to know Ernie Banks when I lived in Chicago, but he always had a smile. He was, he, remember his favorite saying, let's play two, Ed, let's play two. And and he was, you know, obviously he just had a humble personality uh, and, I, and I got to know him. And so he's one of my favorites. Now football, football, I would say my favorite would have to be Jim Brown because he was such a great player. But but the guy I got to know at the end, of, uh, before he died, and I got to know him pretty well. I got to know him as a person was Walter Payton. And I, and I met him. He owned a couple of nightclubs and, and restaurants here in the western suburbs of Chicago. I got there in 94 after his career was over. But let me tell you, there's a reason why they call him sweetness, Walter Payton. As you know, they have the what, – what's the word they give out in the NFL for the, the, the best ambassador every year? The Walter Payton Award? Yes. And so I got to know him. Now basketball, I don't know. I, 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 I really love Bill Russell, and and of course I I thought Oscar Robinson. They were my favorites. But you can't. You got to say Magic is one of the greatest of all time. What he had to go through and his personality. So those those three I like. Now in in golf, you got to go with Tiger Woods. I think he's the greatest. You know, and now what about um, tennis? Nobody talks about the guy that really broke the tennis barrier for 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 African American was Arthur Ashe. Remember Arthur, Arthur Ashe, Ashe was great, great, great uh, tennis player. And and you have to say he is one of the all time greatest. And then <clears throat> and then if you talk about uh, uh, in my uh well, you know, you know what? This is not sports oriented, but but he just passed away a few months ago. But country music, Charlie Pride, what a great he was, and what he did for golf in Albuquerque. Remember Charlie Pride? Oh, you know what? Uh, he had just performed live about a month before that. Uh, his signature song, you know, "Kissing Angel Good Morning." What a beautiful song that was. And then uh, they they don't know if he they they didn't come out with it if he caught COVID or not. But yes, I did read that article in the paper about what he did, uh, the Charlie Pride tournament here, uh, working with SunWest Bank, I believe, at that time, SunWest Bank. And yes, Charlie Pride, uh, what a great memory uh, that was. And what a song. Every time I heard that song, that's the only song I know that he sang. 
Um, I'm not a big fan of country, but that song I was. So yeah, good, great choice there. Walter Payton, I got to know him and he had this club. They used to have a club here in Albuquerque called Studer Bakers. And they had one there, there in the Western suburbs. It was real popular to go. I would go to Studer Bakers and I'll tell you, Walter Payton is the greatest dancer I've ever seen on dance floor. And you know that, what's that TV show, uh, Dancing with Stars? Yes. If Walter Payton ever had a chance to get on that, he died before that show ever came on, he would have won it five times over. He was the greatest dancer I ever saw. Now he would, I would go up to Walter and I said, Walter, why are you? He said, Marty, this is my new football workout. He, he would go to this club. He said, I bought this club so I could work out on the dance floor. And he wasn't much of, matter of fact, he didn't, he wasn't an alcohol drinker. I never saw him drink lemonade, water, culture. That's all he drank, but he would get on the floor and dance for hours, hours. It's unbelievable. You should see, it's like he was doing a workout. Uh, you know, it's funny because uh, he was on the old Soul Train, on the, uh, yes. the, the show Soul Train and he dancing on Soul Train. And they don't put any, just anybody dancing on Soul Train. Uh, incredibly yeah. athletic, could bend backward, flip, do double flips. And, you know, and think about this, Marty. If you think about that, back in the day, he was the Chicago Bears offense. They The, the quarterbacks were Gary Huff, Bob Avellini, Bobby Douglas. They didn't throw the ball well, nor was their offensive line great. They weren't. A lot, their, their whole team for many years was Walter Payton, the whole team. So, you know, you know, it's funny thing about Walter Payton. He, they call him sweetness. He was always smiling. You know, Ed, you and I, you could have just gone up to him. And he would have talked to you and hang out with you for a while. He was just a really guy's guy. And the women loved him. The guy, he could dance all day. But you know what? Emmett Smith won. Emmett Smith won that Dancing with Stars. And not taking anything with, away from Emmett Smith, Walter would have danced around him. That's how good he was. Now, <clears throat> The thing about Walter Payton, I remember going back in 2003, I'm at Dicka's restaurant and I went to Dicka's and I go upstairs in the cigar room and there's Mike Dicka and I'm, I'm with a friend of mine that, that knew Mike Dicka. So we went up there and we started talking to the famous Dicka and I asked Dicka, who's the greatest football player to ever play the game? And, and he, did, he looked at me and he says, Walter Payton. And I said, well, tell me why. He said, Marty, let me tell you this. Walter Payton was a great blocker. I never saw a guy could block like he did. Walter Payton could catch any ball. Walter could return punts and kickoff. Walter was, Walter never got hurt. He played every down. And then here's another thing, Marty. He threw a ball. He could have played quarterback. He threw the ball 60 yards. And I said, wow. And then top us off, he could have been our punter. I saw him punt the ball 55, 60 yards. He says, play, he said, pound for pound. You could say Jim Brown, maybe the greatest player of all time, but but he said, we're not talking about the greatest running back because there might have been better, greater running backs than Walter Payton. I'm talking about the greatest football player. He did everything. And that's why Dick has said he's the greatest player to ever play football because he did everything, block, through, putt, catch, Received hell, he would have sold popcorn at halftime. He would have asked him to do it. Think about this: when they played New England, and they killed. Uh, you know, they beat New England forty-six to ten in the Super Bowl. He doesn't even get to touch. He doesn't get to score, and that became a source of contention between Ditka and Walter Payton for many years. I think they finally got over it, but they gave the uh, touchdown run to the refrigerator over Walter Payton, who had worked all those years. Uh, you know, kind of a sidebar there, but they still won the game, but. Walter Payton was a little bit upset that he didn't get a chance to score in that Super Bowl. Well, you know, they Dicka came on uh, WG, you know, WGN uh, about four years ago, and they were interviewing him on, you know, WGN right. station, and they asked that question. He said, "The greatest regret, the worst thing I ever did, was not giving him a chance to score a touchdown." And I, to this day, I regret it. It just hurts me every time I think about it because I. If I knew how how much it meant for him, I would have done it. But at that time, we were all caught up with refrigerator and all that stuff. But yeah, he admits it about four years ago, and basically he was almost crying during the interview when he yeah, talked. Yeah, 
And you're right. It hurt Walter Payton. He deserved to get that shot. Yeah. But pound for pound, I got to say Walter Payton might be the greatest player. Now, there's been better running backs. There's been, uh, but think of a guy that does it all. You know, he only missed two points. He played every game. I don't think he ever missed a football game. I think he, he got hurt once and played the rest of the season. But can you have, can you imagine how durable Walter Payton was? He was amazing. Amazing. He, he would be considered like Lou Gehrig. And what's the guy that beat Lou Gehrig's record? The, the guy from the Orioles? Cal Ripken. Yeah, he was – I would say Walter Payton is one of the Iron Men of football in, in, in the modern world today. And, yeah, but, no, uh, you're right. So I got to know him. I never got to, I never knew him as a football player. I got to know him when his career was when he was just in retirement. And of course, he died so young on that rare uh, he had that rare liver disease. He died. And, you know, the day uh, that they had a memorial for him at, at Soldier Field, over thirty five thousand people showed up. And it, it was a really cold day. And just a testimony. The people in Chicago loved him. There's a reason why they call him sweetness. Yeah, no doubt. I think it's time to wrap up, Marty. Well, we've got to wrap this up. And we're going to be talking about what makes America great. I want to thank our sponsor, Evergar Roofing and and Solar. And Ed, thanks again. And we'll look forward to talking to you guys next time. And America Talk It Up, watch it on Channel 26, Comcast, Thursday night, 8 o'clock. And God bless everybody. And the best gift Ed and I can give you is the gift of laughter and a smile.